Hi, this is Larry Parman with the estate planning law firm of Parman and Easterday. Today I want to talk to you about a very common topic in the estate planning arena. It comes up all the time. Specifically, what about joint tenancy and how does joint tenancy play into the creation of an estate plan? So today we're going to talk about some estate Today we're going to talk about some joint tenancy basics and give you an alert to what could go wrong with that planning technique. First of all, it's not a planning technique. It's a method of how we own property. So here's how it works. If we have tenant one and tenant two, and they own a tract of land, for example, or any other asset, and if the titling to the property, either the deed or the account form, says that it's joint tenancy, with rights of survivorship sometimes expressed JT WROS on account forms or just JTROS that simply means that each of those people own an undivided 100% of that property and by operation of law if the first joint tenant dies, that property ownership transfers to the survivor by operation of law. There's no probate required. In most states, the only thing that's required is for an affidavit of a surviving joint tenant to be filed at the courthouse. So now here's what happens. Sometimes people will come in and they'll say to us, well, gosh, I don't know why I need to plan because my husband and I owned everything jointly, and when he died, everything went to me. He had a will. It all worked. It all came to me. But the key point is, because of this transfer by operation of law, the fact that the deceased party had a last will and testament was of no importance whatsoever because this last will and testament didn't even operate or had no impact on the transfer of this property. So sometimes people incorrectly conclude that it was the will, the presence of the will that caused that property to go to the survivor. That's not true. It's because embedded within the law of joint tenancy is this operation of law transfer. It happens automatically. So then the question is, if you have tenant number two now owning all that property in their individual name, what happens? Well, the first thing that we know for sure is that all property title in one person's name will go through probate. That's automatic. It will go through probate and will be transferred either according to their last will and testament or by the laws of intestate succession within your state. One way or the other. So what people then sometimes do is instead of creating an estate plan, they'll say, well, gosh, now that I understand that the property went to me by operation of law, they'll say, well, I don't, I don't need an estate plan. Instead, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to take that property, and let's just say it's a piece of real estate. And you know what I'm going to tell you. They'll take that piece of property and they'll say, let's just add my children's name to it. So they'll put John's name on it with her, and the daughter Susan. And let's assume that Susan is married to Jason. We've used them in an example before. But now, if our client Mary decides down the road that she wants to sell that property, at least in Oklahoma, she cannot sign off on that sale just with her signature alone, even though technically that property is titled in her name only. She has to have John sign off on it as a joint tenant, she has to have Susan sign off as a joint tenant. Even more interesting, she also has to have Jason sign off on that transfer because in Oklahoma and most other states, your spouse has a marital right to any real estate that you own. So now you have one, two, three, four people, four signatures required to sell a property that's technically just titled in one person's name. So from a control point of view, it can end up being a real problem. Here's another issue. We had a case a number of years ago where the son-in-law 
as it turns out, was having issues with the IRS and owed the IRS past tax money, well, before the title company would allow that transfer to go through, that IRS lien was against him, and they required that that IRS lien be paid. It exceeded $100,000. And by the way, guess who ended up paying it? Mary ended up paying the IRS for Jason because of his unpaid taxes from past activity. So the one key point here on joint tenancy is what can happen as a byproduct of using joint tenancy as a planning substitute as opposed to just a method by which you own property. And we have a huge issue of potential loss of control. When you get all these parties, parties required to sign off when, do, when uh, assets are sold. The other issue that you have when you start adding people's name to the title to your property is you have gift issues because right now we know that you can transfer or you can gift $13,000 per year to any one of your choice. That's the annual gift exclusion. That can be done, but what happens if you start adding people's name to a $200,000 300 dollars $400,000 piece of property. What will end up happening is that when you make a gift of that lifetime property, that donee will take your basis, will take your tax cost in that property. And then when that property is sold, they will have to pay capital gain on that sale traced back all the way to your cost basis. And by the way, the burden of proving that cost basis is on the taxpayer. So they'll have to find records of what you paid for that property when you acquired it, perhaps in 1958. And that can be a real issue. So you have tax issues there. So this came up one time in a case with us a few years ago where we had a lady come in and she owned a 200000 brokerage account a $100,000 home, two cats and a car and a checking account. And her son came in with her. He was one of four children. Had a big chip on his shoulder. He said, we've already taken care of mom's situation. We don't need any planning. They had put their names, all four, on the Merrill Lynch account. They had put their names all on the deed to her home. Back then, we were creating a living trust for singles for about $2,500. And we proved that by leaving the plan as it is, the children were going to end up incurring a tax cost of about $30,000, and they were going to do that because they didn't want to spend $2,500 to create an effective plan. So here's the teaching point of this session. Joint tenancy is a method by which people own property. It can sometimes work. We see the pitfalls. We see how it can backfire with the loss of control, the potential gift issues, the the basis issues, the, the payment of more tax than you legally have to pay. And one other point on that. See, by creating a trust and leaving this property to the children through a living trust, at the time of death, that fair market value, you might have paid back here for it, might now be worth this. At the time of death, if, they receive, if the children receive that property through a living trust or even a will, they're going to receive what's called step up in basis. And basis is just a technical term for tax cost. So if you bought that property for $100,000 and it's worth $200,000, all that capital gain gets wiped out at the time of death. Whereas the way that the lady that came in with the cats in the bank account and the Merrill Lynch account, they were going to end up paying $30,000 more in tax that the law said they didn't have to pay if they would merely set up an effective estate plan. And then, of course, the final point. Asset exposure, liability exposure. You heard me describe that. When someone owns part of your property, it's now possible that your property might be subject to their creditors. We saw that in the example I shared with you about the lady having to pay the in-laws tax bill with the IRS. So again, joint tenancy, powerful concept used incorrectly, can really come back to haunt you for a number of dis different reasons. We appreciate you being with us today for this brief estate planning overview. You can contact us one of two ways. Our phone number is 888-2000.
405-843-6100. Or you can reach us at www.parmanlaw.com. We appreciate your time. This is Larry Parman, and we'll talk again soon.